Okay, good uh, good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Shazi Arteen and uh, this is our first online lecture that you all are looking at. Basically, we are going to cover in this variety of things including the structures, shapes, molecular configuration of uh, viruses, bacteria like prokaryotes and the different protozoa. So let's start with first of all the viruses. In current scenario when everyone is hearing about um, coronaviruses, it's related infections, diseases, how it is spreading and everything. So a little bit knowledge of viruses has been already updated. But being a biologist, we need to go into a little bit more details. So basically all viruses, they have same basic structure. You will find like every single virus has a nucleic acid that is surrounded by a protein shell. And this protein shell is called as capsid that is made up of a small, a small uh, multiple units of these protein, special proteins called capsules. None of the viruses have any cytoplasm and that is why they do not also carry any kind of organelles or you can see the cell machinery to perform any of the activities. And that is the reason when the viruses are outside the host cell, we call them acellular because they cannot perform any kind of life activities. They are dependent on host cells, host cell machinery to perform their activities. The nucleic acid that uh, viruses have, it can be present within this uh, protein core or the capsid either in the form of a circle or linear. These nucleic acid can be uh, RNA, can be DNA. Further, the RNA can be double stranded or single stranded and similarly DNA can be single stranded or double stranded. This important property of these uh, nucleic acids uh, found inside the viruses. We use it for the classification of the viruses also and that is why you heard about that okay we have the RNA viruses, DNA viruses or the, uh, or the uh, retroviruses etc etc. If you see here uh, or with reference to the size of the viruses and compare them with different other cells uh, you can understand that how smaller the viruses are. For example if you see here we have this green one is a eukaryotic cell that is the yeast cell our common baking yeast it is approximately 7 micrometer in size as compared to this yeast cell if you compare it with the bacteria so here we have two examples of bacteria one is round streptococcus and the other one is the rod, rod that is E. coli so streptococcus are approximately they are measured as one micrometer where the E. coli is an example of a rod bacteria or cucobacilli bacteria and it is approximately two micrometer long in size. As compared to that, the maximum size of the viruses that we have observed is the pox viruses, they are about 250 nanometer and as compared to the pox viruses, the smallest one that we have uh, observed till today is the flavivirus or in common or limit term we call it this night virus that is 22 nanometer in size. If you compare this size of viruses with the proteins that we have in our bodies, for example, hemoglobin, one molecule of hemoglobin is about 15 nanometer in size. So this is just to give you an idea that how small the viruses could be. And then we all are right now talking about the using masks in this uh, coronavirus epidemic. 
the important thing that the physicians and the doctors and the hematologists and the neurologists they are talking about is the filter size of those masks. So the filter size of those masks is usually 0.2 to nanometer, and this is this is made according to just keeping uh, 0.20 nanometer. That is uh, made according to the size of the minimum virus that we have observed so that, that these viruses can walk across the, the filter barrier of the mask and that's how it cannot go into your respiratory system. Or in other words, you can say that the masks that have the filter size of 20 nanometer, they have the capability to protect you from the, the viruses as 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 less as 22 nanometer in size. to the structure of the viruses nearly all viruses form a protein sheath or capsid that I just told you and it is present around the their nucleic acid and it is basically complete composed of repeated units of the few proteins and these each unit is called as capsule some viruses may also have stored specialized enzymes within this uh, nucleic acid core for example, the retroviruses that have the most transcriptase. Similarly, our this coronavirus is also is an RNA virus and has reverse transcriptase in it. What reverse transcriptase do? If you remember from the protein synthesis, normally what happens that uh, the DNA makes the copies uh, in the form of messenger RNA, and these messenger RNA take the uh, take the information from the DNA template to the cytoplasm in towards the ribosome where the help of ribosomal RNA, ribosomes and the uh, transfer RNA. The protein synthesis starts. But those viruses that are their 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 nucleic acid is RNA in nature. They do not have DNA as a template. So what they have to do they by utilizing this reverse transcriptase enzyme they will first convert this uh, RNA template into a uh, DNA and then from that DNA the whole process of photosynthesis, uh, protein synthesis will start. So that's why this reverse transcriptase is very important and you need to leave these particular viruses. Uh, most of the animal viruses they are also um, having an uh, additional uh, layer uh, in their structure that is called as envelope. And this is mostly derived from the host cell membrane uh, with the viral proteins. So here you can see some of the structures of different viruses. Uh, if you see here, <coughs> this is the one of the very common uh, shape uh, and the structure of the viruses called as helical capsid. If you see here, these nucleic acid is present inside this helical, and all the proteins that are present in the core around the nucleic acid, they are arranged in the form of a helical, and that is why we call it helical capsid. So the shape is helical capsid, and you can see this helical structure made up of nucleic acid, that is RNA, and the capsomer proteins collectively called as capsid. Example of this virus is uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Other than that tobacco mosaic virus which is a plant virus, you can also give an example of red viruses or the rabies virus that causes uh, rabies in the, in the, in the uh, humans. Now here we have this icosahedral capsid. Uh, the difference between the icosahedral and the helical you can see here. Icosahedral is a is a is a round structure that has 20 sides, and all these 20 sides are being joined together. And uh, in each side you can see these small small proteins and bodies called as capsules that are arranged surrounding the nucleic acid. One of the common example of this type of shapes of uh, viruses is RNA virus. Now, if you see here the third one, that is Um uh, 
this symmetry you will see mostly in the bacterial pages. Uh, what bacterial pages? Uh, these are the viruses that infect the bacteria. You can see here clearly that it is comprises of two parts. One is the head and one is the tail. Head is the uh, eicosahedral capsid that carries the capsid and the nucleic acid. It could be DNA, it could be RNA. And this is joined or attached with this helical tail with the help of a small collar. At the end of the tail you can see this plate or the disc that carries these, uh, these uh, tail fibers. These tail fibers help uh, the virus in the attachment to the bacterial cell surface. And when once the attachment is happened, after that, the capsid and the helical structure squeezes to inject this nucleic acid into the bacterial cell. So this is eicosahedral head and the helical tail that is commonly observed in the bacterial pages. Then we have these helical capsid within the animal. This is one of the common symmetry of the structure that you can see in the animal viruses. For example, influenza virus, for example, HIV virus, for example, this coronavirus. <coughs> now, if you can see here, uh, inside this green part, this is the helical structure made up of capsomers, so it is capsid that is carrying the nucleic acid inside and then this is this whole symmetry is surrounded by this round envelope that is also carrying these spikes which are basically the antigenic markers of this virus. Now the important thing is that from where this envelope comes so basically when the viruses they are going inside the uh, host cell and they are multiplying and once the multiplication is complete and this helical and then uh, RNA structure is or the nucleic acid is is, uh, is is assembled together they are going to excrete out of the host cell and when they when they came out of the host cell they bring some of the cytoplasmic membrane of the host cell with them and this cytoplasmic membrane is going to serve as the envelope <laughs> So that is why we say that the envelope is the part of the whole cell cytoplasmic membrane. And uh, the spikes that are present on these uh, surfaces of this envelope, they basically are the, are the proteins of the, of the viral region. And they make the one virus different from the other. And these are the antigenic markers that we use to identify these viruses for different type of uh, infections, diseases, and, and how we are going to classify them and how we are going to identify them. Most of the viruses that come in, uh, they, if, if we observe them, that come in two simple shapes, that is helical and by eicosahedral. Some viruses are complex, as I just show you that the T bacteriophages, for example, uh, one of the common or uh, most studied virus uh, bacteriophage is T even phage, and then we have lambda phages also. Then we have fox viruses that are considered as the complex symmetry because they have multi layered capsids. And then some envelope viruses that are also polymorphic. Polymorphic means they may show multiple uh, morphologies. <coughs> <coughs> now, when we say icosahedral viron or virion, these are the structures with 20 equilateral triangular facets. Most of the animal viruses are these icosahedrals and they are most efficient symmetrical arrangement that subunits can take to form a shell with maximum internal capacity and, uh, and the biggest size of the nucleic acid can easily be uh, adjusted within this capacity. This is the bacteriophage I just show you, binary symmetry, capsid head, helical uh, or icosahedral capsid. Fed and then the helical tail 
and they all both are united together by means of the scholar proteins and then they have a base plate tail fibers they helps in the adjustment or the attachment to the different surfaces especially the bacterial cell surfaces and this is an example of the vinyl symmetry with reference to the viral host viruses are obligate into cellular parasite in every kind of organism investigated and the host range it, uh, it depends on different type of organisms that are going to be infected it can be plants it can be animals it can be uh, bacteria between the animals we have variety of different tissues in the cells so the so the so the host cells can be different from different uh, systems <coughs> another important property of the viruses is that they can remain dormant silent in sleeping condition for all that and for years and years and they wait for the right time to start to be get activated when they are going to activate it mostly when the immune system of the host is is, is little lower or decrease and more times of viruses exist than the kind of organism so that's why you can always accept new variety of these viruses coming in with reference to the replication replication means how the the gene or genomic information present in the in the viral the nucleic acid <coughs> is going to be transferred or is going to be replicated so we have two very common ways of replication uh, that have been observed in the viruses the first way is that uh, the, the 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 virus can be thought of as a set of instructions. It uh, tricks the host cell into making viruses. The cell with the virus is often damaged by infection, and virus can only be reproduced inside the cell. Outside, they are metabolically inert variants. Another way is that, that the viruses lack their own ribosomes and enzymes for proteins and nucleic acid synthesis. So they hijack the cell's transcription and translation machineries to express the early genes, middle genes, late genes, and enemies of these assembly and there is not viruses. Now, <coughs> first of all, the viral genomes. They vary greatly in both types of nucleic acid. Like, for example, in animals, we always say that the gene, our genome is DNA. But for the viruses, it could be RNA, it could be DNA, then within the RNA and DNA, it could be double stranded DNA, it could be single stranded DNA, it could be double stranded RNA, it could be double single stranded RNA. So it varies greatly. Most of the RNA viruses are single stranded, they are replicated in the whole cell cytoplasm. Replication in the cytosol or the cytoplasm is error prone and is equivalent to the high rate of it, it, it is going to give you the high rates of mutation. Why? Because there are a lot of other things present within the uh, cytoplasm. And that is why it is also difficult to target for immune system and vaccines and drugs because you are going to affect or target the, the host cell machinery also. Uh, RNA viruses, for example, as I have mentioned, that they could be um, double stranded, could be second single stranded. If they are double stranded, uh, they work uh, differently with the help of the reverse transcriptase. If they are single stranded, they, this single strand can be positive strand that itself can serve as mRNA and then transfer the information to the ribosomal RNA and uh, transfer RNA of the host cell. The negative stranded viruses, they first have to make their their uh, use use that negative strand as a template, and they will first convert into the positive stranded uh, mRNA, and then the whole process will start. While those uh, RNA viruses that have uh, reverse transcriptase, for example, our HIV virus, uh, for example, our coronavirus. 
we have this reverse transcriptase enzyme and with the help of this reverse transcriptase enzyme we first are going to make the DNA using their RNA as a template and then the whole process of protein synthesis will start. On the other hand, the most of the DNA viruses, they are double-stranded and they simply replicate the nucleus of the eukaryotic host cell and then from there they will transfer the information into the cytoplasm and the protein synthesis will go on. <coughs> So most of the viruses, they fit through a 500 nanometer filter, as I have shown you in one of the earlier slides, the different sizes of the viruses that we have also. Human virus does not, they has a rayon 750 nanometer in diameter, genome is more than 1 millibyte, it was originally misidentified as a bacterium, so it is a biggest, one of the biggest viruses that we have also. Besides that, there are several other giant viruses they, that have been found. Maybe virus genome contains nine genes necessary for translation, suggests that these viruses may have once been autonomous. And it basically blurs the line between a virus and an obligate intracellular parasite bacterium. So when we say obligate intracellular parasite means those organisms that need a host cell to survive to multiply. Now we have three very well known categories viruses, chlamydia, rickettsia. Rickettsia and chlamydia are the bacteria. They have their whole machinery and everything, but they need the absence of complete uh, oxygen. So that is why they need the intracellular environment. And they are considered as obligate intracellular parasites. On the other hand, viruses, they need the host cell because they do not have their own machinery. So outside the cellular body or the outside the host cell, they are just the acellular bacteria. So this is like one of the important things that we need to consider that why the viruses are a cellular outside the host cell, while the chlamydia and the rickettsia that these are the bacteria and they are not considered as a cellular, mainly because the viruses they does not have their whole machinery of the organelles to perform different type of cellular activities, while the chlamydia and rickettsia they have all the uh, organelles and they only need the intracellular environment. Now beside these, we have this group of viruses that is called as bacteriophage or the bacteria eater. These are the viruses that can infect the bacteria. <coughs> uh, we also can call them phage for short. And one few of the common viruses or the phages that have been studied till now is the T1 series and T series that is T1, T2, T2, T3 and etc. These viruses have also been found in archaea, another group of uh, prokaryotes. They are different from the bacterial viruses and their characterization is still is in the early stages. Now if you just consider that that uh, binary symmetry that I showed you in the one of the early slide of the bacteriophages and considering that just imagine that okay so two parts head tail head is the capsid plus nucleic acid tail is the helical symmetry and below the tail we have or attached to the tail or the uh, at, the, at the bottom end of the tail attached is the are the are the uh, these uh, fibers for the attachment. So first thing, the bacteria is present in the surrounding. Bacteriophage will come, find the right spot on the bacterial cell surface where it is going to attach with the help of the tail fibers. So this this step is called as attachment or adsorption. It targets the part of bacterial outer surface.
then second part the capsid and the helical will squeeze and penetrate the nucleic acid into the bacterial cell so this is the penetration or injection so it uh, the, the bacteriophage will pierces the cell wall to inject the viral genome now the viral genome is inside the bacterial cell so the third step is going to take place that is synthesis so phage uh, DNA will take over the cells replication and protein synthesis enzyme to synthesize viral component how because this phage DNA is going to integrate into the bacterial DNA which is also uh, open uh, structure and when the DNA of the bacterial cell will replicate at the same time the phage DNA will also replicate and will make the proteins for the, the bacterial phage and that's how the, 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 the synthesis of the viral proteins will start once the viral proteins and the viral structures are are prepared or synthesized within the bacterial cell the fourth step start that is the assembly of the components so the capsid proteins are there capsomers they will unite together to make the capsid when we have beside we also have the nucleic acid of the dna of the of the bacteriophages and these both will combine together assemble together and now we have variety of or the number of these bacteriophages ready inside the cytoplasm of the bacterial cell to release so the mature virus particles are released through the enzymes that lyses the host or budding through host cell wall so what <laughs> So what, what happens basically, there are two ways of release of these mature viruses. One is called the lytic cycle and the other one is called as the lysogenic cycle. So in the lytic cycle what happens that the viruses release an enzyme or the lysine that, uh, that causes the lysis of the bacterial host cell as a result the bacterial host cell will break and all the virus particles will be out this is lytical cycle while on the other hand the lysogenic cycle what happens that the viral particle will push the cytoplasm outside by means of exocytosis and it will come out of the bacterial cell so in that way it will have some of the bacterial cell cytoplasm also on the outer uh, surface of the bacteria of the, of the of the virus assembly and that's how it will become the embryo virus now what is the eclipse period so the time between the adsorption that is attachment and the formation of the new viral particle that is assembly this period is called as eclipse period if a cell is lies at this point few if any active virions can be released but if the complete assembly is done and after that the release will take place maximum number of virions will be out so here you can see in this picture both lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle so first step attachment on the surface of the, of the, of the bacterial cell second penetration of the nucleic acid into the bacterial cytoplasm this nucleic acid is going to integrate into the bacterial cell nucleic acid <laughs> <coughs> and then the replication of the nucleic acid will start and with the replication of this nucleic acid you can see that the synthesis of the viral proteins will also start viral components will start they are available inside the cytoplasm cytoplasm assemble together and once the assembly is complete the bacteria cell will lyse and the viruses will be out this is lytic cycle similar thing after the attachment onto the bacteria cell surface the nucleic acid is injected it is going to be integrated into the genome of the bacterial cell 
multiplication will take place after that you can see here synthesis of all the uh, viral proteins viral components viral cell assembly and then it can be released by means of by means of lysogen that is the what we call it the uh, by means of exocytosis not by the by the breaking down of the of the bacteria so, so basically what happens in the lysogenic cycle We have a latent phase that is virus does not immediately kill the infected cell it's a stay there integrate virus nucleic acid into the host cell genome and this integration allows the virus to be replicated along with the host cell's dna as the host divides and this is called a step rate or lysogenic phage this integrated genome called prophage and the cell containing the prophage uh, called lysogen Phage lambda of E. coli is the best studied lysogenic phage and when phage lambda infects a cell, the early event constitutes a genetic switch that will determine whether the virus is lytic or lysogenic. If the induction is during the stress, the prophage can be excised and begin lytic cycle or requiring turning on to the gene expression necessary for the lytic cycle. see here the phage conversion so during integrated portion of the lysogenic cycle that we just saw some viral gene genes may be expressed um, they, they, they can translate it into various proteins so the phenotypes or the characteristics of the lysogenic bacterium can be altered by the prophage like for example in case of Vibrio cholera this is a bacteria that causes cholera <coughs> if this Vibrio cholera bacteria is infected by a bacteriophage, it uh, is going to introduce a gene into the bacteria or Vibrio cholera bacteria uh, genome that is responsible for the production of cholera toxin. This gene becomes incorporated into the host genome and it converts the harmless bacteria into disease causing bacteria so only those vibrio cholera bacteria that has this this infection by the lysogenic phage of the of the bacteriophage and they get this gene from the bacteriophage for the cholera toxin produce production they will be the the disease causing vibrio cholera otherwise the vibrio cholera is harmless Similarly, if you look for HIV virus, human immunodeficiency virus, <coughs> 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 that causes uh, uh, AIDS. Basically, AIDS was first reported in the US in 1981. Its origin is, is said to be in Africa somewhere in 1950s. <laughs> It is a virus that is closely related to the semi immunodeficiency virus that causes prob similar problem with the monkeys or semi monkeys. Some people are resistant to this HIV infection. Who? Those who are exposed rep repeatedly never become positive. Uh, some become HIV positive without developing the AIDS syndrome. And others have little resistance and progress rapidly from the infection to the death. Now, how the the resistance to this HIV virus develops? <coughs> Sorry. So variability in resistance may be due to selective pressure by smallpox virus. Now, before its eradication, 
this is small pox virus killed billions and billions of people and most of the people who are resistant to HIV infection they have a mutation in their CCRF R5 gene historical appearance and distribution of this the CCR5 allele it correlates with timing and geography of the smallpox outbreaks so if those individuals who are having these genes are whether they or their ancestors have been in those geographical areas where smallpox has been happening they might have these genes and they are considered to be resistant to the HIV infection okay so we are going to continue this in our next session so this is the part one and part two we will be having so